Hello, Aubrey. Good to see you. What's up, Tim? You guys are jumping in on here. All right. Welcome to the final episode of Soapbox Sunday for 2021. It's going to be a really good one, a really inspiring episode, folks. A good feel-good story that I have for you guys today. I tell you, Lisa Tulipani introduced me to this phenomenal woman that's going to be my guest. And boy, her journey thus far has already inspired me to just even give more. So that's my gift to you. I want you guys to be inspired just like I have been by the likes and the talents and the genius of Aubrey Talent. Hey, Tim. Thank you so much for jumping on. Blue Mail USA, how are you? Boy, I'm excited. <laughs> this is getting ready to get out of here for the holidays. I've been really busy. But, um, you know, it's what it is. I'm excited to go see my parents. I haven't seen them since 2019. What? Wow. It's a long time. So I'm going to love on them for a good amount of time, even in about a week. I'll be in Texas. So for two weeks, there'll be no soapbox and me. I'll be back on the second. And yeah, we'll kick the year off in 2022 with, with exciting guests and all that good stuff. Hit share and tell your friends that we're on. I know my replay audience is much bigger than my live, but I love to have you guys in the live chat and all that good stuff. So where are you guys? Uh, Tim, Tim, I think you're here in um, L.A., right? No? I know Aubrey is in California. Oh, thank you so much, Tim. I appreciate that. Yeah, it'll be a great reunion. <laughs> That's exactly what it'll be, a family reunion. What's up, Joel? Wow, look at that face. Joel, how are you? Joel inspires me as well. I tell you, anytime I slack up at the gym, I see his post, I'm like, God, I gotta go. I love junk food. <laughs> it's one of my few luxuries. Yeah, but not bad junk food. I like, you know, really good hearty junk food. Like french fries. <laughs> so yeah, Joel's good to see you. Any holiday plans, Mr. Lackey? Yes. This part is so fun. I love being able to catch up with you guys and banter and wax and chat and talk. And all that good stuff. But we're going to get started here shortly. I can. I can't see you guys know, but... She'll be able to, you'll be able to see myself and Aubrey here in a second. But no, I can't see you guys. It's a lie. You can only see me. Folks, welcome to Soapbox Sunday. I am Jermaine Taylor. There is a song that's predominantly sung in black culture that states, If I could help somebody as I pass along, then my living shall not be in vain. My guest today embodies those lyrics after the unexpected challenge of birthing and now raising a child with special needs. She found purpose in her life, meaning in the trauma. Not only did she redefine her life, but she developed a curriculum so that others can do the same. In this season of giving that we're in, I wanted to honor and highlight someone who does just that. She's a winner, folks. She's a post-traumatic growth coach for parents of kids with disabilities. And she is my last guest of the year of Soapbox Sunday with, um, with Jermaine Taylor 2021. So I really, really thank her so much for saying yes. And without further ado, give me some hand clap emojis and let me bring on Aubrey Talent on the Soapbox. Hold on, guys. She is jumping on. <clears throat> Give it a few seconds here. She'll pop on here shortly. Let's see here. Hey, thank you for the Hi, I don't know if you can hear me. Send me another request, Aubrey, so I can get you on here. Hmm. Can you guys see I can't Aubrey? see or hear you at all. I don't know if you, you can hear? see or hear me. <clears throat> all right, Aubrey, send me one more request and we can get you on here. Let me know if you guys can see her because I can't see her just yet. <laughs> oh, okay, so uh, delete the request and send me another request, Aubrey. 
Okay, there we go. Oh, it said you're unable to join. I wouldn't, let me try it again. Hold on. All right, let's see here. <clears throat> All righty. We may have to start this live one more time. Hold on. I wonder what's going on with Instagram. Instagram can do some weird things here. People can see Aubrey Willowell, but you can't see me. I wonder what is that about? I'm all set up. You guys were able to hear me beginning. It's just now it's doing some weird things. Aubrey, let yourself off the soapbox and join back on so I can accept you again. I feel like it's an Instagram thing because uh, you guys are very... Oh, you, got, you see the both of me now. I, well, I can't see her. Well, just give it a second. Let it kind of reset here and maybe it'll join on. Thank you so much, Tim, for your feedback. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> this is really weird. Are you on? Well, she should be on her phone like we practice. It said you're unable to join. I'm just That's the message that I'm getting. All right, so let's try it again. All right, it's saying you're unable to join, which is really, really weird. Thank you so much, Tim. I really appreciate it. I don't know what's going on. It's saying unable to join on my end, and it normally means it's a Instagram. There you go. What's going on, girl? I Yay! <laughs> oh, technology. It annoys me. <laughs> Sometimes I have the perfect connection, and other times it just goes south like it did today. But you're on here now. How are you doing, love? I am doing so well. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Oh, sweetie, that's what you've done. Like I told you in the pre-production, a little phone call we had. I have been diving into your material and it, it's been helping me in the couple of weeks that I've been getting to know you through your bio and through your posts and through Lisa by extension, you mm -hmm. have this amazing journey. And I wanted to like end the season in my first half of my third season on a note of just giving, you know, because we're in the mm -hmm. season of giving and that's what your life has been made out of. It was birth out of trauma, out of pain but you have redefined it and you're giving to others. And that's what this platform is all about, your story. So let me I ask appreciate you, it. Yes. Let me ask you, before you were even pregnant with any of your children, mm -hmm. what were your thoughts about motherhood, Aubrey? Like, what did you envision it to be? Oh, gosh. You know, it's a really great question because mm -hmm. so much of the grief around what happened to my son Mm -hmm. um, has to do with how different this parenting journey is from what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. So I really expected, you know, what, what I think most people expect, the typical, you know, like Christmas, for example, we would, the kids would come running down the stairs and tear yeah. open their presents. And I expected, I remember the first time I realized my son was very unlikely to ever speak or be able to tell me that he loved me. And just, just the grief in that. Now, was um, he your first child, or did you have children before you? He was my first. He also has a little sister now as well. Okay. Yeah. Now, when you had him, mm -hmm. were there any indications throughout the pregnancy and during the pregnancy that there were going to be challenges, or was it just this huge surprise when he got here? It was a huge surprise. He, even during uh, labor, he seemed to be doing well. And then he was born and he didn't take a breath. And in that moment, I felt like my whole world was, was falling apart. But you still have this like, well, it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, we're going to be one of those stories where everything looked terrible. And then the kid was perfectly normal. And that is not what happened. And that is what I'm grateful for. Wow. Was there any guilt attached to it that you may have done something wrong? Did you immediately go to victimhood? Did you replay the entire pregnancy in your mind? Because mind you, you said this is your first child. Yep. So I'm wondering, were you like wondering, what did I do wrong in those nine or eight months that led to this? Yeah. What was, I mean, what were those initial feelings that were bombarding you in that delivery room? It's such a, it's such an insightful question, really, because all the parents that I've worked with have that Moms especially, I think mm -hmm. we're really good at the mom guilt. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when the child, when you've grown that child inside your body, it's so easy to think, I should have been able to protect them. I should have known something was wrong. And in my situation, we still don't know what happened. 
Um, and so it's so easy to go back, like you were saying, to like, was it that one time I got a massage? Was it that yeah. one time yeah. that I, you know? But we don't know. And, and your question about victimhood, I lived in that victim place mm. for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And I remember waking up one morning, my son's, uh, he has a feeding tube, his feeding tube pump was beeping. I immediately thought about, I need to get his food going, I need to give him his seizure medicine. I immediately thought about all of these things and I felt so trapped. Mm -hmm. And so many of those victim, disempowering victim ideas in my head of why us, this isn't fair, I don't want this, I can't be happy with this life. Mm -hmm. And I realized in that moment, I can either continue to feel stuck or if I can't change the circumstances, the only thing left is to change my perspective. Did they send you home with a plan? Was there an extended doctor's? I mean, hospital stay? Like, how does that happen when you're, he's born and then there's these, this is disability that you were not expecting. Do they keep him there for a little while just to monitor him? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in the NICU for six weeks. Okay. Um, and there was a period in, within the first week, he was on a ventilator. <laughs> um, he was connected to all kinds of tubes and machines and I didn't even get to hold him for the first week of his life mm -hmm. and there was a moment in that first week that I know many people who I've worked with have experienced something similar where the doctors the team of doctors comes and says you might want to just let him go maybe mm -hmm. he's not not here to meant to stay here um, and I remember in that moment thinking okay if he's willing to fight then I'm gonna fight with him. Yeah. And he, they took him, I said, no, we're not gonna sign a do not resuscitate. We're gonna, if, if you try to remove the ventilator and it doesn't work, we want you to put him back on it. And the first time they tried to take him off, it didn't work. And if we had signed that do not resuscitate, he wouldn't be here today. Right. And the second time they took him off, he was able to breathe on his own. Eventually he came home. And, and your question, yeah, about, uh, oh my God, at this point he has, I've lost count of how many diagnoses, doctors, medications. I think we see 12 different specialists. Wow. So even at those early stages, you were showing signs of determination. You were hmm. showing signs of fight. And I guess it was through him that you were realizing the fight that was inside of you. Yeah. So it started giving early on that, you know, the yes. seeds were being planted from the moment he got here. You just didn't know what it was going to grow from it. Oh, this is such a beautiful story. I hope I don't yeah. cry. <laughs> I will probably cry. So you cry <laughs> along with me. <laughs> All right. So the immediate lifestyle changes, Aubrey, when you get home. Are you renovating the house? Are you like finding nurses that come in? Like, how did this all of a sudden change your home? Because I'm pretty sure you had the nursery all set up, but now it's going to be redefined and changed into something else. So he never, yeah, yeah, yeah. He never spent a night in the nursery. Um, he was too unstable. And so we had him, we, before he was discharged from the hospital, we had to go out and get a little tiny crib we could put right next to the bed in the bedroom so that we could be close in case he stopped breathing, in case he had a seizure, in case mm -hmm. so many uh, things that could have happened. Um, and, and he does still have seizures to this day. Mm -hmm. um, and so we didn't, we didn't renovate the house right away, um, but we did immediately have this whole plethora of doctors and nurses and physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, feeding therapists. I mean, your whole life becomes yeah. focused on the meta. You, you start to feel like you're a, a nurse and a therapist mm -hmm. rather than a parent. Mm -hmm. So as you're putting all of this emphasis on his survival, this on getting him to a healthier place, a livable place, mm -hmm. what are you doing? Is there anything that you're doing for Aubrey to keep yourself sane? Or were you just pretty much putting all the energy into him? So, yeah, in the beginning, and this is why I talk a lot about helping parents get out of survival mode. In the beginning, mm -hmm. you say, okay, I'm going to fight, and you live in the fight. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, that's necessary. Right. Um, at some point, you realize you cannot keep living in survival mode. Yeah. You can't constantly have this energy of, I'm going to fight and I'm just going to power my way through it and I'm just going to be strong because it's a marathon and 
you'll burn out. And that's what happens. Most parents who come to me have gotten to that place of, I can't keep fighting. I am too exhausted. Um, and so it becomes about, and, and this is so hard for parents like us to really internalize, but I have to put myself before my children. Yeah. Did it strain your relationships, Aubrey? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, my husband and I divorced, my ex-husband and I divorced about four years ago. And, you know, there were other issues, of course, but I, I think the divorce rate for parents of kids with disabilities is something like 80%. Really? Um, it's so common because you have all of this pain and grief and you're just, so many parts of your life get broken down. Right. And it can be really hard if you don't know already how to turn towards each other fully. Right. It, it just becomes so hard to maintain a relationship. Um, and the other thing that I experienced that most parents that I've talked to experience is a lot of people who you thought were really going to be there in your corner. I was just, to ask you outside the home. Yeah. How were those? Yeah. Hmm. A lot did of people it, just can't. It was too, yeah. It was too much for them to like take on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's scary for people. They don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. Do you find that you were asking a lot more people around you because you didn't have enough help and that led to the strain? Or were there just more like, wait a minute, that's a fire. I can't go near it. I can support her when I can, but I can't be as there as often as she'd like. I think, I think it's a couple of things. Certainly I was asking more from people, but also... The thing about an experience like this, the thing about mm. trauma, right. um, is that it, it breaks you down. Mm. It breaks you down completely. Mm -hmm. And you stop, you stop caring as much about social niceties. You start mm. really, you, have, you become a different person. You do. And, and the people who can't go to that deep place with you, the people who can't sit there and listen to you say, my son may never walk or talk and he has seizures and I'm scared. Some people just aren't equipped to go there with you. You become, and I can sort of empathize with that, not on your level, but you do become a different person. You become a more intentional person. Yes. You see yes. where you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's you the perfect word exactly for it. How you need to get there. You map out a plan that plan may not work and you quickly map out another one. And a lot of people, they don't know what you're doing, but they sense that intensity and it's a yeah. bit of an intimidation. Yeah, yeah, you exactly. <laughs> you lose patience for small talk. You really, really <laughs> do because you realize the value of your time. You've wasted a yeah. lot of time. And when, in your case, when you're dealing with a child who has a, a disability, time is of the essence. You know, mm -hmm. you can't wait on a lot of things. You need it yesterday sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. Are you always satisfied with your doctors though? Or are you always looking for <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I think any other parents like me who are listening to this are probably also laughing. Uh -huh. uh, uh, I mean, we could have a whole nother like hour long conversation just on that. So how do I sum yeah. it up? No, certainly not okay. always satisfied. Um, no. A lot of doctors I have found, and, and let me start by saying we have some incredible doctors who have made right. profound difference in our yeah. lives. Um, but it can be challenging to find doctors who have a good bedside manner. <laughs> mm, that way. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Um, the darkness that comes with it at the end of the mm. day, when you're by yourself and you put them down, you know, to bed and your other yeah. child is, you know, sleeping, you know, that's when the real work began. That's when the real demons hit you because it's still, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where do, you go where do I to, yeah where do I go now or where did I go before where did you go initially initially I used a lot of distraction to avoid going there mm -hmm. um, whether it was <laughs> oh cookies cookies are my thing um, alcohol for a while was my thing um, candy crush that was mm -hmm. a fantastic distraction um, yeah. TV, anything that made it so I didn't have to hear and feel, yeah. really feel all of those things. Now, 
I have practices, and this is a lot of what I teach my clients, is practices to allow myself to feel what I feel. Because what I know now is that if I let it happen, if I let the feelings be there, I accept them, I turn towards them, they move through me rather mm -hmm. than living inside me and growing and getting bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When did the pivot begin? When did you start working on yourself and then realizing, wait a minute, I'm learning a whole lot about what I'm going through. I'm being made better as a result of it. There's a mom over here that I've been chatting with. Let me see if I can just give her a little of my information to see how well she progresses. When did that yeah. start happening internally? I mean, it was such a journey. I would say my own transformation really started that morning that I described where I thought I can either be stuck or I can choose to change my perspective. Mm -hmm. And at that point I started looking for tools uh, that could help me change my perspective. And then when my daughter was a baby, my, um, my son's little sister, we signed up for a baby sign language class together. And mm. the wife of the guy who taught the class was a life coach. Mm. And I, my son had to have a really major surgery shortly after that. And so I started working with her to process mm. all of the grief and the darkness. And the, the tools that she taught me made such a difference that I thought, I have to do this. I have to learn this and share it with other people. You mentioned your daughter. When she was born, did she bring new energy into the house to make everything a little bit more livable and more, yeah. dare I, I don't want to say normal, mm. but just give it a sense of balance, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Oh. She really gave me the opportunity to experience all of those normal parenting things that I didn't get. Like, yeah. like being able to hold your child right after birth, being able to yeah. breastfeed, right. being able to, to go to play dates. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, many of those I don't things. I want to call it a do over, but you know, the things that you just described, those are the things that you look forward to. You want yeah. to check off on your mom's list, you know, and yeah. obviously you couldn't do that the first time with Lucas, but you were able yep. to do that with your second child. That's the beautiful yeah. part. I was hoping, I didn't know how to ask that question. <laughs> Because a lot of this, you know, you want to walk a little gingerly, but you That's told me fair. That you're an open book, but at the same time, I have to respect boundaries. <laughs> I'm totally open. If you cross a boundary, I will let you know. <laughs> As you are discovering, you know, this better part of who you are and you're realizing that you want to go out and, you know, change other parents' perspectives that are going through this and make their lives yeah. better as a result of the things that you're learning. Mm -hmm. The environment around you, how are you seeing things now? Are you, is it things like a lot more, is it lighter in terms or brighter perspectives? In my own world, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in your own world, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's interesting because um, that surgery that I mentioned that my son had to have when my daughter was a baby, which was, that was like seven years ago, he actually had to have that same surgery again three months ago. Oh, wow. Which, yeah, which gave me the opportunity to go through it as the person that I am now, with the tools that I have now. And yes, it was hard. Mm -hmm. But now instead of saying, I can't handle hard, I don't want hard, I can say, okay, this is hard. Give myself so much love and compassion. Spend time meditating. Do the self-care things. Go outside. Go for a walk that I know are crucial to my mental health. And it was hard, but it was a hell of a lot easier than, than last time he went yeah. through that surgery. What is it a gradual attraction of clients that you were finding or were you putting up flyers? How were you getting the word out that you had tools mm. that could make this journey better? Like how did you begin the practice that you do have now? Yeah, that's a really great question. It, it tends to be a combination of, you know, I post on social media. Um, I belong to a number of groups on Facebook for parents of kids with different diagnoses. Um, <clears throat> my son has a whole slew of them, so there are many different groups that I'm part of. Um, so reaching out to people that way. And then a lot of the clients that I've found recently have come from word of mouth because mm. somebody says, oh, this was transformational for me, and I want to share it with my friend who's in this yeah. other group over here. 
What is the common thread, that mental state that they're mostly in when they come to you? Like, what are they generally all feeling when you get them initially? Burnout and overwhelm. Yeah. Yeah. Just are they like, looking for a quick yeah. fix or just to get away or somebody to talk to? Like, what is it they want to hear? Oh, you know, I think... I think one of the things that most clients really, really need when they first come to me is somebody to talk to, is yeah. somebody to talk to who gets it because it can be so isolating. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned survival mode of a few minutes earlier, and mm -hmm. I kind of <clears throat> know what that's like. You can go for years living in survival mode and not even know it. Yep. You really can. So in terms yeah. of parents with children with uh, special needs, what is their survival mode? Is it normally centered around that child, just making sure he has this at this hour, this at that hour, you're eating, mm -hmm. he's eating? Is, it's just a routine of life centered around him? Is that the survival mode you're speaking of or not? Yeah, it's that. It's also it's something that I really, I, th I think is really important to acknowledge is that there is a trauma that parents go through, whether it's, you know, my situation where my son wasn't breathing at birth or, Everything seems fine, and then suddenly you get this diagnosis. Um, there is a trauma, and after trauma, the survival mode is I have to hold on to everything like this because I feel like I'm out of control, and the only way to stay safe is to control. And so we approach everything with that, okay, if I just white-knuckle my way through it, then I can make sure we all stay safe. Um, and, and it sounds like you may know this as well from your own experience. Most of life actually is out of our control. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And when we use so mm. much energy trying to force things, trying to keep control, then we end up being less prepared sure. for the things that come up in life that, that blindside us. But the joy of that is, you know, when that problem comes around again, because I do believe things are cyclical, they might happen, they may happen in a different way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because you've been through it before, you're sort of smarter as to how to approach it that next time. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, you know. And, well, that's been my, trust me, it's taken me 50, 11 times to get it right. <laughs> but, you know, that's the joy of living because you're like, wait a minute, yeah. this is the problem. It's not the same problem. But let me just access this in a different way, learning what I gathered from the last trauma. And yes. perhaps I can get through it a lot quicker, less, you know, fallout from it. Yeah, does yeah. Does grief and anger ever leave, Aubrey? Mm. Or does it come in waves? Does it ebb and flow? Or does these things mm -hmm. trigger it? What is that? Yeah. It, this is something uh, so many of the clients that I work with hate to hear. But mm -hmm. it doesn't. It doesn't ever go away. Okay. However, it gets easier because like I mentioned before with, with, you know, the strong emotions, the pain that comes up when grief comes up for me now, I, I recognize it a lot sooner and I let myself feel it. I create a safe space for me to feel it. And I know what kind of support I need to help me through it. I know when it starts to feel like too much and I need to take a break that I can do that but I don't live in the grief anymore. Do you, in your practice, do you encourage a surrender to what is or more mm. of an acceptance to what is? Oh, I'm curious what the difference is. I feel mind. like a surrender is just more of, okay, this is just, this is just, a, this is just where we are. I can't mm. change it. Mm -hmm. But an acceptance implies, in my opinion, in mm -hmm. action. I've accepted it. Now let me get to work on finding an action to getting around it. That's my, that's, a, that, that's how I process it. Mm, it makes interesting. Sense to it. It makes sense to me. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Is it, because I feel like when you surrender to something, you, you pretty much give up, you, you're powerless. You know, uh, you're surrendering okay. your power. Okay. So if you accept it, okay, I've accepted it, but I've accepted it on my own terms. You know what then, I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> in that, in yeah. that context, the way you've put it, I would say acceptance is what I encourage. Yeah. yeah. It's a, because if we don't accept, then we're resisting. Mm -hmm. And if we're resisting the way that things are, then we're using so much precious energy in that resistance. Mm -hmm. 
and it makes it so much more painful. Yeah. No, and this is my, my show, my interview, but, you know, just to piggyback on what I just said, yeah. when I was in the thick of my darkness, there was yeah. a time when I said, let me just surrender to it. And when I realized I surrendered, I was like, wait a minute, I'm being lazy. I'm not doing anything. I'm just living mm. in the problem. Mm. And when I redefined, I said, I, I, yeah, it's here. Let me just accept it. And I felt like when I accepted it, I began to find solution because I started yes. power. <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly what I find too. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it was a warped way of me putting it. But you know, perhaps I should have like prefaced it with that before I asked you the question. But it's a show. Um, you mentioned in your bio that, well, Barbara, I forget her last. I don't think you mentioned her last name, but she reviewed you in your bio, and she said mm. you weren't. Uh, scared to ask the difficult questions mm. and that stuck out to me because I'm like hmm I wonder are people just kind of scared to a they don't know what to say to parents with this if for fear of like a, upsetting them even more or making them angry mm -hmm. so what is it about your practice that allows you to go ahead and ask these people these difficult questions and they're able to answer them are they finally relieved that someone opened that box if you will yeah, yeah, I think it is that mm -hmm. I I get it on so many levels right. that a lot of other people don't. And so I can ask the question and say, you know, the reason I'm asking the question is because in my experience, mm -hmm. I experienced this, this, and this. That, and, and I might share something that they've been thinking and feeling but didn't ever think it was okay to say out loud. Sure. So it How creates that space. Yeah. The gratitude in a challenge that's ongoing, because you mentioned Ooh, that yeah. in the bio as well, finding the gratitude. Mm -hmm. And to me, I know how I found it, mm -hmm. but I also found a solution. But mm -hmm. something in your particular case, when the child is going to have that disability for his life, mm -hmm. how do you find that gratitude and live in that gratitude and sustain it? Yeah. Or is it just going to be a part of all the emotions that come with it? Yeah, you might be angry today, but guess what? I'm angry, but I'm still grateful. <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh. I have so many yeah. things to say to that. Um, so, okay. so, yeah, what you just said is a big, big part of it. Finally recognizing that it's not one or the other, that mm -hmm. I can be in grief and gratitude simultaneously. Okay. I can be in anger and gratitude simultaneously. And for me, the gratitude comes from really looking at all of the gifts, all of the, the things that have grown and blossomed in me, the deeper, more meaningful life that I have as a result of my son and his, his brain injury. Yeah. Do you give your clients homework and they come back to you with their findings? Like, how is the curriculum developed to where, you know, you could see progress? Like, how are you measuring it? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it will depend on when I first start working with somebody, we will talk about what are your main goals for this work together. Um, with most clients, I typically start with having them keep a gratitude journal, okay. which is kind of a cliche thing. Everybody's talked about gratitude journals at this point, right? And it, mm -hmm. it can sound so simple. Sure. And like, maybe it's not going to help that much. But every single time somebody does it, they come back and say, Wow, yeah. I feel different. Well, it activates already. a sensory that you know you don't know that you're not using. You know, you're yes. writing, you're touching, and when you're engaging all of your senses, therein you find the healing. So yeah. no, I totally get the gratitude journal. I'm not as you know dedicated to my journal as I once was, but when I did it, I realized that I was growing a lot more as a human being because I was taking time to document my experiences. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you're seeing breakthroughs in your clients, do you actually mm. see that actually? Or like, how do you, before they even say it, you know, do you see it that they've changed or there's a different perspective or how are you measuring that you, you're, you're cutting through some of the dark? Yeah, I can feel it. I can feel it mm -hmm. in the tone. So typically when I work with somebody, uh, we don't do video. We just do okay. audio okay. because that allows me to listen in a different way. I can okay. hear the energy underneath what somebody is saying. Oh, wow. And so I'll hear a, a, a slightly different tone or a slightly different way of framing something. Okay. Um, and, and very often my clients will say some big profound change that's happened and then be like, but it doesn't really count because, and I'll be like, no, wait, that was huge what you just said. You sure. are starting to yeah. shift and be more empowered. 
Yeah. Are these clients, are they mostly insular type people who aren't used to talking? Or are you finding that you're just, you know, finding a whole wide range of personalities that are coming in? Yeah, it runs the gamut. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Because I feel like when you're dealing with, per, uh, especially a disability, a child, a lot of it's so personal. You're so guarded. And even with someone who can help them, there's just so much they're going to share. <laughs> so are you having to pry open, you know, to get them to release? Typically not. And again, I think it speaks to the fact that I share so much of my story, you know, on yeah. my website and my posts that it helps them feel open to do so. And, and I, I tend to find the opposite that often clients are like, oh, my God, I've waited so long to share this. Here's all of it. <laughs> uh -huh. Do you find that, and this is me getting a little political, there okay. is a lot of help, you know, federally, even statewide mm. that you're, is that, is that actually going hand in hand with your practice? Are you finding that you're getting support from government and political figures, or are you guys having to advocate for these particular causes? Most, yeah, most parents have to really, 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 really advocate to get the supports for their kids. Even if they happen to live in a state that has a lot of support, it's still a lot of fighting to get it really? to actually, oh yeah. Yeah. Why do you suppose, is it because it's just common bureaucracy with any time you're getting help from the government or there's just, are they tone deaf? Like, because it's widespread now. So why do you suppose that, you know, it's hard to get relief or something that's so almost commonplace, you know? You know, and this is maybe me getting a little political, but I think, mm -hmm. I think part of it is bureaucracy okay. for sure. Um, but I also think that disability is one of those things that we still look away from. We still don't want to accept. Mm -hmm. um, it's still so, so deeply stigmatized mm -hmm. that that certainly comes into play. Mm -hmm. hmm. You're a Martha Beck life coach. Mm -hmm. What does Martha Beck life coach me <laughs> so I did my life coach training through um, Martha Beck Inc and Martha Beck is the person who trained the life coach that I worked with uh, okay. seven years ago and the reason I was drawn to her work is because she has a child with Down syndrome mm. and so I felt like ah she gets it and if she's saying to me you can live a happy life then she probably really means it. Yeah. Um, and, and the basic, the really simple way to summarize her approach is this idea that we, we have an essential self and we have a social self. Uh -huh. And our essential self is who we really are, what we really want. Uh -huh. Our social self is often, we do things that, that go against our essential self to try to appease the social self, to try to, uh -huh. to think, you know, what will other people think is the right thing for me to do? Sure. Um, and the more we do things that are aligned with our <clears throat> essential self, the happier we'll be. Let's pull this train in a little bit and get back to you. Yeah. What are you discovering today about yourself mm. in the journey, in your practice, even in your dealings with Lucas, even dealing with your daughter? Mm -hmm. um, what are you discovering about yourself today that you're grateful for that you didn't know about yourself prior to? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> hmm. I think one of the biggest growth areas for me recently mm. has been self-compassion. Mm. Really recognizing how hard I am on myself, how much I beat myself up, and that this is kind of radical, but it's okay to be nice to myself. Sure. No doubt. <laughs> oh my gosh. But for so many of us to really internalize that and really practice deeply loving ourselves. Yeah. We don't do that. I guess you're um, right. you are right. Give yourself permission to, you know, do something for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Were you before Lucas was even born? Did yeah. you like who you were? Ooh. I would say largely no. Okay. Um, and, and that's pretty, my cat has decided to join the podcast. I um, see. <laughs> that, 
That is primarily because I struggled with a lot of anxiety and depression my whole life. And, and I thought there must be something wrong with me that I struggle with those things. Um, now I know that, that just like this situation with my son, my anxiety and depression are part of what allow me to give the gifts that I have to mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. So through him, you were able to heal those deficiencies. God, that's a beautiful yeah. part of the journey. I often tell yeah. people, so I'm glad for the lessons in life that I have, but I wish there was another way to them. <laughs> <laughs> a client said to me recently, uh -huh. I, I said something about, you know, this is an opportunity for growth. And she said, <sighs> I'm just so tired of growing. <laughs> I know, being under construction. Will this house be built already? Oh my God, for years, I would even hate to go around people knowing that the needle hadn't moved in my life. Mm. Just wondering, oh my God, is he still going through that? And that's when it becomes deeply personal, Aubrey, because yeah. you realize, wait a minute, they're just not going to understand that this is going to take the scenic route for me. You know, it's gonna take me. <laughs> I'm going to steal that. I like that. <laughs> you can, you know, because oftentimes, and I have a hard hit, mm -hmm. I will do something the same way a million times, thinking I can get there. Uh -huh. And then it'll just open up. But mm -hmm. that's not always the case. Sometimes it just takes people like me, and I'll just say me, a longer path to get to that solution. It just yeah. does. And when yeah. you get it, you savor it. And you yeah. create platforms like yours, like mine, to give it out because it was hard earned. Yes. Oh my yes. God, you're making me all teary up on this. I don't <laughs> want to get all sad and mushy on my last episode of the year. Darn. <laughs> For anyone that's going through any kind of challenge, because a lot of what you teach is transferable, it can go in any direction that problems people are going through. What is a parting message that you would give to anyone that's dealing with a challenge? that's going to be around for the duration. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going mm -hmm. to find that happily ever after. Yeah. It's going to be something that you're going to have to just make a part of your life. What is that mm -hmm. message that you can give to someone? I guess my message is you can find a happily ever after. It's mm -hmm. just going to look so different than you thought. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> when I tell you that is a tweetable moment, <laughs> I will credit Aubrey Talent Coaching when I post it, but I will be using it. <laughs> and I didn't plan that. Let oh, yes. Just say, yeah, I know. Those are the moments that just happen on this platform that I'm just so grateful for. Mm. Let me just thank you so much, Aubrey, for just being so generous to this show. Like I said, I wanted to end my year on a note of just being thankful for the people that give, not just this time of the mm -hmm. year, but give all year round. And your platform, what you're doing, what it was birthed out of, yeah. it just personifies exactly what this show is all about, the story, and mm -hmm. the story being able to help others. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And you have a great holiday season. Thank you. You cat. too. <laughs> <laughs> I will. All right, Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Folks, we will be back January 2nd for the next two weeks. I will be off. I'll be in Texas with my family. But thank you so much for supporting me this last four months of the year, my third season. And I'll be back in January, January 2nd with Maya Contreras. She's running for Congress their District 12 in New York, and it'll be a really exciting show. She's a very formidable candidate, and I cannot wait to introduce you guys to her. She has some really great ideas as to how to turn this country of ours around. All right, folks, thank you so much. Have a great holiday season, and I'll talk to you in the top of the year. Happy New Year. Bye, guys. <laughs>